Ia ku nui, ia ku rahi, ia ku whakatamarahi ki te rangi e koutou a kua tae mai nei a ki tēne whare wānanga o tātou nō reira nau mai, haere mai ki AUT University te wānanga aronu o tāma ki Makaurau. Me tā koe mihi nei ki tō tātou rangatira kua tae mai i Uropi a rā ki a koe te Commissioner ngā nau mai, haere mai ki a koe. Nō mātou te honore kua tae mai koe ki te whakarangatira, ki te whakanui i tēnei huihuinga o tātou nō rira nau mai, haere mai whakatau mai rā. Me taku mihi atu ki a koe te minita Rāwari Pāka nau mai hoki mai. Hoki mai ki AUT nei he honore anō nō mātou kua hoki mai koe ki te whakanui i tēnei kaupapu o tātou. O tira ki a koutou katoa. Koutou katoa kua tae mai i tēnā pitu o Aotearoa, i tēnā pitu o Aotearoa, nō konei anō hoki, nau mai, haere mai, whakatau mai rā, ki tēnei whare, ko ai te ingoa te whare nei, ko te whare uropi. Nō reira i runga anō i tēnā āhuatanga, nau mai, whakatau mai rā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. A ka huri au ki te reo tuarua i tēnei wā tonu. Ladies and gentlemen, family and friends, boys and girls, that's us. Welcome again to Europe House. Welcome to Te Wānanga Aronui o Tāmaki Makaurau, AUT University. And I'd like to uh, give a special welcome to the Commissioner for coming. Um, it is definitely a delight to have to be able to host you. And of course, it is, uh, is an honour to have you here in Aotearoa, here in Tāmaki Makaurau. Tāmaki Makaurau being the land loved by hundreds. Uh, so welcome to Tāmaki, Tāmaki Makaurau. Um, to uh, Minister David Parker, we must have done something right because we got invited back. Um, so <laughs> welcome back, um, Minister um, Parker. Um, and to ourselves, um, welcome to everyone who've come from different parts of Aotearoa, different parts of the world, and of course, your own different um, communities. So welcome to uh, the Sui, welcome to AUT. Um, it is uh, tikanga or it is appropriate for ourselves to sing a song after a speech, so I'm going to ask if we can all sing the song E Tū Tātou. Tū tira mai ngā iwi, tātou tātou e. Tū tira mai ngā iwi, tātou tātou e. Mai a te maramatanga, me te aroha e ngā iwi, ki a tāpatahi, ki a patahi rā. Um, let us have a look at the words Tu Tira Mai Ngā Iwi. So Tu Tira Mai Ngā Iwi is a song composed in the 1950s by Wi Huata. Wi Huata from the tribal area of Ngāti Kahungunu was actually composed for his mokopuna grandchildren at the lake called Lake Tu Tira. Tu Tira Mai. Tu is to stand, Tira as a group. So stand as a group, Mai Ngā Iwi, to all the peoples, irrespective of who you are, where you come from. Whaia te maramatanga. Whaia is to pursue, to chase. Maramatanga. Maramatanga is derived from the word marama, and marama is the Māori word for moon. And as we know, when it's a full moon on a dark night, it provides lights, it provides clarity, it provides enlightenment. So maramatanga, therefore, is understanding, understanding and, and an appreciation. And I'm sure that's why we're here today, to, for the pursuit of understanding and enlightenment. And of course, the other, and I think which underpins our hui, which is meti aroha. And aroha, loosely translated, is love. But when we have a look at the word aroha, we have the word aro, which is to understand, to focus, to channel, and our own personal ha. If everyone can breathe in for me, please breathe in. And exhale. So that's our ha. That's our ha. That's our life force. In Star Wars, they call it the force. Uh, but it's our life principle, our ethos. And so when we understand and focus our own personal ha, then we have word, wonderful words like passion, like compassion, like love, inspiration, all those wonderful things. And I'd like to think that our hui this morning is going to be underpinned by the kaupapa, by the concept of aroha. Ka pai. As we go on, we have kia tapatahi, kia kotahi rā. Let us stand as one, stand together, tato, tato e. All of us together, irrespective of who we are, where we come from. And who would have thought that this song would underpin uh, this discussion all the way back in 1950, right to 2018. So in a real true sense of tu tira mai ngā iwi, tātou, tātou e, welcome to our hui, tēnā koutou, 
tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I'd just like to introduce myself. Um, I am a teacher here at AUT University. Um, a part of my job also is cultural advisor to the Vice-Chancellor and also providing uh, cultural support across the university. Um, so my role here today is to facilitate discussions between the panel and of course yourselves. Um, so I'm not on anyone's side or anything like that. However, if there is a um, foreign posting, I would be um, more than welcome to, um, to considering that. Um, so I'll be facilitating the day, the um, glamorised MC for the day. Um, so we'll, I'll be uh, fielding questions from yourselves as well as receiving questions um, that are going to come through online. Kāpai. Um, I'm going to now invite uh, Minister David Parker to um, say a few words. So, Norida ite minita, no mai hara mai, faka eke mai ra. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that delightful start, Valence. It's, uh, that was uh, very kind of you to, to do that for us and to welcome us in that way. Can I also uh, begin by um, uh, thanking the European Union for funding this, <laughs> this room? as opposed to this event. <laughs> uh, um, uh, many of you will know that we are in the, the, the European, what's the name of it? The European U House. Europe House. Uh, I was going to call it Europa House, but that's an old petrol brand in New Zealand, so <laughs> we won't use that. Um, uh, can I uh, acknowledge uh, the ambassadors, other members of the diplomatic uh, community? I see a fellow MP, uh, formerly former colleague from the House here, welcome. Can I thank all of uh, the other uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps, uh, civil society who's turned out, but uh, most of all, uh, the person who's come furthest of all, uh, Dr Cecilia Malmstrom, the uh, EU Commissioner uh, for Trade, uh, one of the most senior trade, nego trade negotiators in, <laughs> uh, in the world. <laughs> no, that's not an omen. Um, <laughs> oh, that's very good. <laughs> oh, that's very good, very good. Ina mana, ina reo, ina iwi, rangatira ma, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Thanks for uh, joining us here to celebrate the formal uh, launch of negotiations for a free trade agreement between the European Union and New Zealand. Uh, today is an opportunity for those with an interest in the agreement to meet, to learn more uh, to, and to discuss their views. Of course, the official launch of these negotiations comes at a time when trade is in the news, sometimes for many of the wrong reasons. The rising tide of protectionism around the world, the danger that tit-for-tat uh, actions, uh, which are at one level justified, but also risk escalating into a trade war, uh, which if it hasn't already started, um, uh, seems a bit a closer prospect than was the case uh, even months ago. And it makes talks like these all, all the more important. Uh, I think both Europe and New Zealand uh, agree that if like-minded countries uh, like us, like Australia, like other CPTPP countries, uh, can come together and talk uh, about trade and agreed to a trading relationship that is rules-based, then uh, not just our respective countries are winners, but, but the world is a winner, particularly if these agreements include appropriate provisions to improve environmental and labour outcomes and the like. Uh, the losers uh, begin when nations start trading tariffs uh, rather than goods and services. Some pretty basic economic propositions sit behind trade. We should do what we do well in order to pay for the things that we need to import from overseas. Uh, and if we do that, New Zealand is never going to produce cars or computers or mobile phones cost effectively. In order for us to import the things affordably uh, and in order to, for us to uh, get a decent return for our products, we have to have the rule of law applying uh, to trade just as the rule of law is important to other parts of society. That's not to say that this government believes that all trade agreements uh, are all good, nor that we believe trade agreements to be the be-all and end-all. Uh, you'll be aware that we've listened to critics of previous trade talks, including the TPP. We've made changes to our negotiating position uh, and to the final deal that became CPTPP. 
Perhaps more importantly, more broadly, we've engaged with civil society. In fact, just some months ago, as Valence was saying, we had another outreach meeting here that was open to anyone, our critics, and some of our critics came along and asked searching questions and we, uh, we tried to deal with them to the best of our ability. So we've uh, engaged with those, including those opposed to aspects of, to, uh, aspects of TPP, and we agreed with some of their concerns. The result uh, was a better deal with the other 10 PPP nations and a much level, lower level of opposition inside the country uh, and the prospect that more nations uh, might join that rules-based framework. In an increasingly uncertain trade world, these sorts of deals act as a buttress against the effects of rising protectionism that I've mentioned. They are only a second line of defence. We don't see them as a first line of defence. Uh, the, but the, that first line of defence, the rules-based system that sits within the World Trade Organisation, is uh, under threat, and the most obvious example that's known to most is the threats to the appellate body, which is effectively the court to which you appeal to if you've got a dispute that people are breaching the WTO rules. That group that resolves those disputes ceases to function in about a year uh, if members cannot be appointed, and at the moment um, the blockage, there are blockages to the appointment of new members of the appellate body by the United States. So these are all reasons why I'm so pleased to be welcoming Commissioner Malmstrom to New Zealand for the official launch of these talks. We're natural partners in so many ways. We've got a rich shared history. So many of our institutions are actually based on European institutional models. So is our same fundamental commitment to human rights, democracy, the rule of law, labour rights and environmental standards. So for me this launch this week is, it really is an exciting step forward uh, to, to make this relationship even closer. It's been many, many, many decades since the, Euro, uh, since the United Kingdom effectively uh, divorced New Zealand and uh, went into the European Union with some pretty significant effects for New Zealand. And ever since then, we've actually wanted to have improving trade relationships uh, with Europe. So it's very pleasing for us uh, decades later to be, um, to be embarking upon that journey. Somewhat ironic that at that very time, the uh, United Kingdom is choosing uh, to reverse their earlier marriage. Uh, but that happens in life. <laughs> it's happened to me. <laughs> um, um, New Zealand is a trading nation, and we always will be. Uh, trade is a critical part of our economy, with around 620,000 New Zealand jobs depending on uh, exports. Of course, the EU is one of the world's largest trading entities. It's our third largest trading partner, with two-way trade in 2017 at $20 billion. Even without the UK, and some of that trade actually into the UK ends up in the European Union, uh, but even without the UK, trade between us is still currently worth $16 billion annually. Now the EU, uh, the European New Zealand Free Trade Agreement will bring real benefits to both sides. Uh, these negotiations offer significant opportunities for our business communities to make economic gains for New Zealand and for the European Union. The free trade agreement, if we uh, complete it as we expect to, will reduce costs uh, that our business face by uh, improving market access, by removing tariffs and other barriers making trade easier and cheaper. And this means more choice for consumers and the growth of the New Zealand economy with improving living standards. But the value of the, uh, an agreement between the European Union and New Zealand is not merely commercial. Given the close alignment of our values, it could also provide a model for what can be achieved between two parties committed to progressive and inclusive trade parties that benefit all people by supporting our broader social and environmental objectives. Now, this government uh, believes that everyone should benefit from trade and economic growth. And indeed, it's, I think it's this underlying sort of erosion of public trust in trade that has led, and some of it's been justified, to be honest, but it has led to governments around the world, including in Europe, they, they led this before we did, um, uh, by trying to engage with civil society to have a discussion with people about what worries them, to be more transparent about what it is that we do. 
Um, and that's why we launched our own Trade for All agenda earlier this year, um, as I have previously acknowledged to the Commissioner stealing the European name, uh, <laughs> which was uh, much better than the long name that had been previously ascribed to it by um, by uh, the, the New Zealand government officials and I had a hand in that too, but so I'm not blaming them. But we thought there was such a long moniker that no one would understand it, uh, and we shortened it to trade for all, which captures what we want, which is trade that benefits all people. So we're going to be having a wide-ranging public consultation uh, with New Zealanders that will address these uh, global and regional issues, uh, and we invite you all to contribute. The, this agenda is an opportunity for us to hear and acknowledge and respond to concerns of New Zealanders in an ever more complex global environment. Some of you will be aware that in respect of CPTPP we ask people to particularise their concerns and we've really done our best to give them specific answers to specific queries, to point them to clauses in the agreement that we believe uh, address some of those concerns. And where there were residual concerns we were willing to hear those and provide another iteration of of uh, how we think uh, some of those uh, things can be uh, properly protected. The Trade for All agenda has been strongly advocated for by Commissioner Malmström and it's another example of the like-mindedness of New Zealand and the European Union. We share a vision of driving economic progress in a way that protects the environment by tackling issues such as climate change and contributing to better living conditions. We share the concerns that people have about the effect of digitalisation on traditional work patterns. We don't think that trade is the blame for that. In fact, we don't think overall it's a bad thing. Uh, it will, um, you know, it will improve society overall. But it's very uncomfortable uh, and hard for the people whose traditional occupations are disrupted by technology. And we believe in New Zealand the answer to that lies in good supports for training and education and further training and further education as well as social welfare supports uh, for people and free health systems and the like, rather than saying that we shouldn't have trade. Although we no doubt face challenges in how to realise this new type of agreement, uh, which goes further in respect of protecting these environmental standards and labour standards and the like, both the European Union and New Zealand want an ambitious agreement which supports sustainable development, that protects minimum work standards and safeguards, and the ability of both sides to properly regulate and decide what is best for our people. In line with our government's trade for all agenda, New Zealand and the European Union will also explore how the agreement can support gender equality, small and medium-sized enter enterprises, indigenous rights and regional economic development. We've also got to focus on transparency and the importance of ongoing consultation with the public. My motivation for that is actually I quite like the settings that we have in New Zealand that are liberal and outward looking and respectful of minorities. And I don't want a rise of discontent which pushes people to the margins that in my opinion threatens those settings long term. So I want to be open in these consultations in order to take the people with us, in order to protect what we uh, hold dear, which is those liberal democratic values. So um, as was announced yesterday, we'll be holding a series of face-to-face -face consultations with the public um, between September and November, uh, and we encourage you all to attend these events to learn more about the uh, European Union New Zealand Agreement, to share your views uh, and to put your questions. We've also announced a new call for public submissions, which will uh, in a written form which will run until 17th of September and you can find information on the Ministry's website about our key objectives and the negotiations to inform your submissions uh, when you make them. So once again can I thank you uh, uh, for coming along for the chance uh, to, to uh, discuss these issues with you. We do want to achieve an agreement that benefits all New Zealanders and correspondingly brings benefits to the people of the European Union. So I thank you uh, for the time uh, that you're giving to us today. Thanks very much.
um, Minister uh, Kia Whāraki here, Ofakaro Kei Wanganui Atato. Thank you for your your speech. Um, I'd like to now uh, invite uh, the Commissioner up to uh, the, the microphone to address everybody. Um, Commissioner, just to give you a brief explanation of the hongi. So the hongi is not only just a touching of noses, um, but if we go back to modi, or the life force, breathing in and breathing out. So we all have our own personal modi, our own life pre- uh, force and ethos. And so the hongi is the connection of your own personal modi with someone else's and in that way it is the sharing of personal modi and the biggest compliment you can give to another human being so i'd like to invite you to the podium now i am very happy to be here today to talk about trade and our relationships here yesterday as minister parker said we were launching together the start of the free trade negotiations between new zealand and the european union and that is a very good um, it's a good news, it's a good start. Uh, we aim to facilitate trade between us, of course, increased uh, access to each other's market, especially for small and medium-sized enterprises. These are the backbone of your economy, but also for ours. We have, of course, big companies as well, and we are facilitating for them. But big companies have easier ways to find their ways uh, to the markets, but smaller companies, even family companies, they, they can't sit a dozen of people to go through the rules and the, 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 the new trade agreements. So we will try to focus and to facilitate, to have specific chapters, specific considerations, specific contact points, specific user-friendly uh, material, websites, etc., to encourage our small and medium-sized companies to take that step, if they want, uh, to, to the European or to the New Zealand uh, market. And they are also very much locally um, anchored, so, so they represent very much of their communities and that's also a way to bring trade closer to, to people because then people in the different communities see that oh they can employ a little bit more people because they can invest they can grow and so on and that is how we we, we go about by bringing trade uh, for all by bringing it back to uh, to the the communities we're also looking at simplifying rules red tape bureaucracy etc and we will have and this is very important for for the european union and i know it is also for new zealand an ambitious chapter section on trade and sustainable development because making a uh, trade um, fair sustainable um, respecting labor norms consumer protection maintaining our high standards are very important parts of uh, trade today and i'll come back to that so this is of course economically important it can create uh, and it, it will create new jobs uh, investment growth but it's also a strategic launch that we did today it is reinforcing already very strong historical ties and relationship making them stronger because trade is very much about people to people so we are also uniting people in, in this trade agreement and it sends a, song, a strong global signal that new zealand and the european union standing up for open rule-based trade and this is important today as others are questioning the import the the, the significance of uh, global trade rules in Europe, like here, we have also had, and we still have, a very intense debate on the benefits or the non-benefits of trade. Many feel scepticism, there are questions and worries and concerns. Some of these are related to trade, but more general, I would say, they are related to the quick globalization that, that many people feel is going too, too fast for them to, to, to catch up with. And we have also, as, as the minister mentioned, we have tried to, um, to see how we can bring trade closer to citizens and to uh, respond to some of these concerns. And we've done that in a strategic um, policy that, that we have called Trade for All, uh, where we want to focus on, on efficiency, transparency and values. Efficiency is, of course, making sure that a trade agreement can be very beautiful on paper, but it has to work. It has to work for the small and medium-sized companies. It has to deal with relevant issues, uh, services, uh, data flows, things that are important for companies today. And it has to make a difference for the consumers. So we need to make sure that we don't just take a um, a sigh of relief once the, the agreement is signed, but that's when the work starts. You need to spread the news, the gospel, uh, so that people feel that they can really use the possibilities that we are opening for them. It has to be transparent and inclusive. 
trade negotiations are sometimes very technical, but people want to be involved. And the European Union is actually the biggest trader in the world. We're the biggest exporter, the biggest importer, the biggest investor. So people want to be involved. They want to know how we trade. Uh, and we can do that by releasing a lot of information around trade, meaning that we now publish uh, the, 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 the mandates, our mandate, meaning our proposal, uh, will be published next week, so you can read it uh, as well. We publish um, uh, material around every trade negotiations on our website, the chapters, uh, background material, user-friendly information as well on different subjects, and public summaries of every negotiation round. And once an agreement is done, waiting for the legal scrubbing and translation, usually it's a very long document of more than that 1,000 pages, it is there to read. If you have a sleepless night, you can go and read uh, one of our trade agreements uh, online. 1,600 pages for the Canadian one, for instance. Uh, lovely reading. I won't tell you how it ends. Uh, and we also need to make sure that people are involved, that we include people in trade. Listening, and this is what we are doing here today, listening of course to business, big and small, but also trade unions, uh, environmental organisations, consumer organisations, different organisations who could directly or indirectly be involved or who just want to be part of it. We have a permanent advisory um, um, I wouldn't say advisory club, but advisory um, organization with uh, NGOs and all the stakeholders with whom we meet regularly. And we also listen to their advice and try to take them into to our, our trade negotiations because trade negotiations today are so complex. And as I said, the third element, efficiency, transparency and values. We need to project our values in trade agreements. We just not trade because trade is good. Trade has to be done in a responsible uh, fair and sustainable way. And here we are so happy uh, that, that we are totally online with the New Zealand government, with, with Minister Parker himself, and I think big parts of, of the society uh, here as well. Because people want to know how this is made. Mm -hmm. Is it made by children? What are the conditions in that factory? Can you organize yourself? What are the safety conditions? Of course, we cannot change all that only by a trade agreement, but we can try to create platforms and dialogues to improve these conditions when we talk about international standards in labor, in, in um, human rights and environmental protection. Mm -hmm. So this is how we have tried to, to, to reform and to, to strengthen our trade uh, policy because trade is actually good. Like I also come from a, a small country in the north. We are totally trade dependent, and the European Union has has done well in in trading. It has created a lot of jobs. Thirty one million jobs in the European Union are dependent on exports only. And then there are several millions depending on imports, of course, because there there's the two ways. And these jobs tend to be better in the way that they are better paid and more qualified. So we need more of them, and we need to engage uh, people. In, in that. Uh, and that's why we have an ambitious agenda. We are negotiating, we just launched here today, uh, yesterday uh, with New Zealand, uh, earlier this week with Australia. We finished and we have a very good uh, and ambitious trade agreement with Canada. We have just concluded with Japan, with, uh, with uh, Mexico, Singapore, Vietnam. We are negotiating with the four countries of Mercosur, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay and Paraguay and others. And we are working with many other countries to strengthen the global trade system, setting out joint global rules in the WTO, the World Trade Organization, which is far from perfect, but it is the organization that we have. 164 countries are members, almost every country of the world. And it has managed to, to protect trade, to, to, to uh, um, boost trade, and also set rules that has been, been benefiting all of us, and not least uh, vulnerable and, and, and small countries. So that, that is very important that we continue to reform and strengthen the WTO, including the appellate body because today it is it is threatened. So uh, we need to build trust in this system on all levels. We need to make sure that people feel that trade, globalization works for all, that we bring the benefits of trade widely. And there, of course, we go into lots of other politics. I mean, distribution system, tax systems, uh, social welfare systems, uh, making sure that people are, are trained uh, and educated so that they can change jobs uh, accordingly. Uh, and this is something where, where also we have have more to do to make sure that, that, that globalization uh, and the trade part of that also works for everybody. And that's why it's so important to have this 
constant dialogue with citizens. And that's why I'm so happy to be here today, because this is for you and, and the different organizations or, or, or um, um, whatever you, you, you represent or, or as, as individuals. So thank you very much again for organizing this. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm looking very much forward to our discussion. OK. Does anyone have any questions? All right. It's too. Uh, to, to the to the minister, will the um, FDA include uh, or, or can it include common uh, policies around environmental standards for agriculture? And if so, is it your intention that it will? Uh, in terms of uh, phytosanitary standards that are imposed at the border, uh, the uh, European Union and New Zealand will be trying to see if we can recognise each other systems as being equivalent. Um, so that uh, there aren't inappropriate excuses used to block the importation of product or to complicate it with bureaucratic rules that people try to find their way through. Um, so that will be a matter that negotiators are trying to... to In-country uh, practices? Uh, well, we, we won't be trying to change the way in which the European Union regulates for their biosecurity rules at the border. Um, uh, neither will they be trying to change what we do at the border, but we will be trying to satisfy ourselves that each of those systems are for genuine phytosanitary reasons, and if they are, that we can recognise each other's systems. Thank you. Uh, kia ora te whanau. Um, could I just get your name, please? Uh, yes, Murray Parish Institute of Forestry. Kia ora tēnā koe. Aye. Kia ora, uh, Robert Reid, uh, representing today the Council of Trade Unions. Um, question really for both of you that, uh, of course, the um, trade unions here and civil society groups, as the Minister has outlined, um, were uh, quite opposed to a number of the things that were in the uh, CPTPA. Um, some of them, I understand, are off the list for this agreement. And I just want sort of some general, there has been talk around um, 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 ISDS um, uh, matters, uh, but the other one were the concerns I think of New Zealanders were things like uh, land uh, purchases, like farmer and big farmer, like e-commerce and how we sort of control the disruptive effects that um, e-commerce can have on a small country. So I just wondered if um, as well as maybe particularly on ISDS, but on any of the other issues, whether, um, I know we're at the beginning of the process, but um, are some of them sort of you know, off the table or do some have similar, or do you sort of have similar concerns on that? And the other question really, which surprised me, but that the media uh, were talking about geographical indicators being of a concern. I mean, I think we already are happy to call your champagne champagne. And uh, um, is it a concern from your end, or is it a con or our end, or is it a concern that you're still not prepared to accept our um, uh, manuka honey, or, or call it that? Um, shall I shall I have a crack at that first? Because um, I'm aware, uh, Commissioner, of the issues that were most controversial under CPTPP. Uh, in respect of uh, one of the most controversial issues, which was ISDS clauses, where just about every country in the world has gone one way or another over time and changed their mind. Uh, when we came to government, uh, we decided that although there are some arguments in favour of ISDS clauses when you are uh, dealing with a country that has got a uh, you know, perhaps a corrupt judiciary uh, or a judiciary that's very close to the government and is not truly independent. Um, uh, overall, uh, we thought that the deficits in ISDS processes outweigh the benefits. We noted that um, the only uh, entities that can effectively use ISDS clauses are the large multinationals because it's a very expensive process and they're pretty well able to look after their own interests anyway including by causing their governments to uh, enforce agreements on a government-to-government -government basis rather than a corporate-to-government basis. Uh, we also thought that the criticisms that were made of having um, uh, trade lawyers one day become 
uh, independent arbitrators one day only to go back to being trade lawyers the next day um, meant that they were uh, open to the allegation of bias because judiciary are meant to give up their day job in order to become truly independent for the rest of their lives as judicial officers. Uh, uh, I know that the European Union oppose, oh sorry, so on that basis, uh, and then the final, sorry, the final reason was that we didn't think it was right that a multinational should have more rights to sue the New Zealand government uh, for investments in New Zealand than a New Zealand company investing in our own country. So for all of those reasons, we as a government changed the prior negotiating mandate and said we're now opposed to them, noting that most other countries in the world have gone flip-flop, flip-flop through the years, except the European Union, who's been opposed to them for a long, long time. So the European Union's opposed to those as well and have a, a European Trade Court initiative, which I'm sure the Commissioner can address. The issue is less pressing in respect of our respective countries under this agreement anyway, because we both have good uh, judicial systems, and because there isn't an investment chapter, so a lot of these concerns arise in respect of investment protocols. The things that you were saying in respect of e-commerce, e-commerce is also of enormous benefit, and in any event, it's happening. Uh, so it has to be properly bought within the rules of trade agreements to be properly regulated. Uh, the European Union, again, is leading the world on some of the ways that you get this right, inc including in respect of data protection, which is a very complex issue, um, but which the, um, and on geographic indicators, um, uh, that'll be a matter that's negotiated. We traditionally in New Zealand have been a little threatened by geographic indicators because we can see that they can be used as a restrictive trade practice. Uh, and uh, But having said that, we've, um, uh, we now try and protect uh, uh, um, you know, Marlborough, Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, so we're on our own journey in respect of those things, uh, and we'll, you know, that'll be a matter that works its way through the negotiation. Thank you. Yes, uh, I agree that we are also. Uh, we had a very, very intense and, and emotional debate on ISDS in in the European Union. So we have started to to reform the system because we noted that this debate was present all over the world, and that many countries are looking at how to reform it or and it was better that we maybe did it together. So we have taken an initiative uh, to work to see if we can establish a multilateral investment court who would take over many of the existing uh, and, and possibly future uh, agreement as well. So that would be a, a sort of international court with independent uh, rosters of, uh, of, of um, arbitrators who would be subject to very strict code of conduct and, uh, and a, a system with two layers of uh, appeal and full transparency and so on. So this is work that is ongoing within the UNCITRAL, which is the United Nations Trade Committee, uh, in order to involve the maximum of countries. Obviously, we take a long time before an international court is established, but, but discussions are ongoing, and I, I think that, that that is fruitful. In the meantime, we have also reformed systems, so we have a more court-like uh, bilateral system that we have with Canada, not that we think we will use it with Canada, but also with Vietnam, where it's probably more more useful, and and with some some other countries. Um, on the um, uh, on the geographical indications, I think we would be more than welcome to recognise your your what was it Manuka honey? Yeah, so, I mean, if that is if that is something that is made in a special way from a specific uh, region or, or so on, I think that that could actually boost. We are, we have seen that that geographical in indications. I mean is a quality stamp as well. You know that you really get the real thing, and there's a lot of money involved in that for, for companies. And sometimes it could be quite small companies uh, producing that. So, so we will definitely discuss it. Um, on most issues, I don't think there would be any problems. There could be a few uh, names where, where there's production here as, and there as well, in, in cheeses ma mainly. But we will discuss it. Uh, we'll find a, a way. I, I don't think this, uh, this, uh, this agreement would be jeopardized uh, by, by, by these discussions. We will find ways uh, to, to handle it. Um, I think that was the question. I think on the, on the other issues, I agree with the minister. Uh, thank you, Minister Parker. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I think it's very, very positive to hear uh, the background, the progressive and inclusive nature of, of the agreement. Um, one of the things that concerns me a little bit is we haven't really had much of the discussion in New Zealand yet around what changes to trade policy might need to take place in order for trade really to meet the trade for all 
criterion. And, and for example, one of the things that, that concerns me is the deregulatory nature of the agreements. Very much they're around restricting the ability of governments to regulate on, on, uh, uh, in ways that might turn out to be trade barriers or ways that, that, that might um, be burdensome uh, on trade. Uh, and that's true in, in services as well as in product trade. Um, and, and that's typically addressed at the end of the line by social and environmental uh, carve-outs uh, and permissions to regulate. But the concern is um, for unanticipated uh, regulation that might be needed in future. And I think trade agreements have never really uh, address that well, where there are unintended, um, uh, unanticipated needs for regulation uh, which are not currently able to be anticipated by governments. Other ways in which you will be able to look at some deeper issues around these trade agreements before starting on the detailed line-by-line -line negotiations, will there be engagement with civil society in New Zealand, in the European Union, on some of these issues, and is there an opportunity to actually have some joint discussions between, for example, civil society in the European Union and in New Zealand? Sorry, I should have introduced myself. Barry Coates, uh, member of civil society. Thank you. I think that would be a wonderful idea. I guess it will have to be. It. I mean, th there is already cooperation between the the. Um, the the consumers organizations, umbrella organizations, uh, I know, and some between the trade unions. Uh, but a joint civil society event, I guess that could be organized via video link. It could be, be an interesting thing to explore. Absolutely, I take that uh, with me. On, on, on your, your specific questions, um, I mean, we're only just <laughs> starting, and, and the real negotiations we start in a couple of weeks, uh, third week of July in, in Brussels, where our teams are coming together uh, to look at this. But our traditional approach to this has been like, for instance, public services. Uh, there, there is nothing, from our point of view, we, this is, has been online, nothing in any trade agreement can force privatization of public services. So it is up to a country or a region or a state or a municipal, however you're organized, to decide upon this. So if you have private education, then you can open up for competition because then you you know, also a European could bid on that. If you don't have it, we, nobody will force you to privatize on this. So education, health, uh, s sanitary, uh, water services, things, things like that. And also, if there is a change of government who has, I mean, before maybe it was privatized and the change, uh, the government withdraws that, that, that proposal, as long as it is non-discriminatory, there is nothing in a trade agreement stopping you to do that. Absolutely not. This is very sensitive also for, for our, our consumers back home uh, in, in Europe. And the idea is, of course, that, that while we will facilitate certain regulations when it comes to uh, that you don't have to have double standards and that you don't have to test your things twice when you do it basically the same way in order to obtain the license or the certificate. Th these are technical matters that we will discuss. But if there are general reg genuine regulations in our respective countries to protect the environment or the consumer or the, the, the general safety, these do not change. Then it means that if I want to sell a product on your market, I have to respect your rules. And if you want to send, sell a product in my market, you have to respect my rules. They don't have to be the same, but you have to adopt to the respective rules. And that, that I think works. It, it, that is already the case today. So we're not going to change that. Uh, I'm open to that discussion too. Uh, uh, all trade agreements build on the last one. It is to a certain extent an iterative process and that's why they've ended up 1,600 pages long. Uh, uh, um, on the one hand, um, when we uh, deal with specific concerns like uh, CPTPP, for example, has got specific provisions in respect of tobacco uh, uh, measures, uh, and uh, because people asked for it, uh, but it's also got general measures there to protect the general right to regulate. And then when you put the specific in, someone else says, "Well, why is my specific not there?" And so there is, you know, we actually try to do both to have both the general and the specific, but we're open to discussion on language. Yes, they do actually have to be open to changing circumstance and uh, I, I would say that one of the changing circumstances for me in the world in, in the last couple of decades is this rapid concentration of wealth to the 1% at the top, which the world has not got under control. I think Thomas Piketty and you know he's proven that and uh, it's true in New Zealand, 
although we started at a more equal place than a lot of the countries, we've got those problems in New Zealand. Uh, it's also true in other countries around the world to a worse extent than it is here. And um, that's actually one of the reasons why we reflected on that coming into government, saying that our trade agreements were too restrictive in respect of some of the uh, ability to have controls on investment and uh, why we've had to move very quickly in advance of CPTPP coming into effect to effectively plug the hole in our screening laws to, to preserve policy space for ourselves and future governments to exert some control as to whether we want our land markets to be affected by effectively very wealthy people from overseas coming to outbid New Zealanders for what we think should be uh, sold within a New Zealand market. So I think that's actually a fair example of where our trade agreements weren't forward thinking enough because we've actually had to do that very quickly because of some of the investment pr protocols in our earlier agreements. It's actually not going to be an issue in the European agreement. Um, it, it wasn't, you know, it was properly protected in the, um, in the uh, China Free Trade Agreement uh, where there, both countries have got the right to control those sorts of things and indeed China does and we're now doing it. But because of the most favoured nation clause in the China Agreement, if we hadn't fixed that, that would also have flowed through to that agreement. So I'm very alert to those issues, uh, um, but um, we are fallible and uh, so we're reliant on civil society advice as to where the pitfalls lie. Uh, thank you very much for your time, Commissioner and Mr. Parker. Uh, my name's Adam Dalgleish. I'm a PhD student in applied ethics from up the road. Uh, just popped in. Uh, <laughs> I'm doing refugee studies. I'm not quite sure how I got to trade, but I do have an interesting trade question. Um, so very recently in the sort of global sphere, there's been a bit of a shift um, and a bit of a barrier broken down between humanitarian aims and trade aims with the World Bank giving or releasing many million dollars in loans uh, to countries on behalf in order for them to meet uh, the needs of refugees in particular with the Jordan Compact. Um, and the EU in particular has uh, sort of trade negotiations where companies that are based in Jordan that employ refugees get trade concessions. Basically bridging that gap between uh, humanitarian aims and trade aims. And I was wondering if there was any space within agreements such as these for New Zealand and the European Union, which have very similar values, to come together and have some humanitarian things fall out of it um, on top of the social and environmental aims of the agreement. Thank you very much, and, and I can see that you follow these things very very closely. Uh, absolutely, we have this with Jordan, and I think that this is a trend that should be welcomed uh, because it's a it's a way, uh, as the minister said, that we, we are adapting to, to global change. We need to, to follow suit uh, as well. I would say that in the actual trade agreement, there would not maybe be, be, be these possibilities, but, but the trade agreement is one part of a bigger partnership that we have with each other, a partnership agreement, which is a more political agreement where we, we commit to cooperate on all kinds of areas uh, defined by, by our, our politicians. It could be, be security, it could be environment, it could be uh, innovation and, and, uh, and, and research, uh, things like that. So there's absolutely space there to do joint things, and I know that my colleague, uh, Commissioner Mamicia, who is responsible for development assistance will be coming here very shortly to meet with your foreign minister and they will do a little Asia Pacific tour to see how they can cooperate uh, in, in that area so that has obviously a humanitarian um, and development uh, aspect uh, I think this is just the first tour to discuss how, how to, to, to work jointly this is obviously an, an area that, that you know much better uh, and, and where we are eager to, to learn from your experiences and, and, and knowledge here uh, so I, I think that there, there could be space to do this in, in a lot of different forums as you say we, we have such a strong common base on, on, on these values so, so um, I mean the, the sky is the limit. Uh, I, I would agree. Um, um, we, we've got to be a bit uh, careful that we don't expect to trade agreements to take over the obligations of all the other parts of the multilateral system, uh, whether it's on environment or refugee issues. Uh, um, it is. I, I do find it. Uh, it's actually something Vernon Smith, uh, Vernon Small, in my own office has said to me often that there's a st there's a strange, almost hypocrisy in the argument that. One of the reasons that trade agreements is evil are evil is that uh, countries give up their sovereignty 
uh, in respect of some issues, and then uh, uh, other people say trade agreements are evil because they don't give enough of their sovereignty up by binding themselves for the future through a trade agreement. And so uh, uh, th there, are, there, are, there is a sort of a, a, a dichotomy there that we actually want trade agreements to be doing force for good in the world, uh, um, but we can't expect trade agreements to be the substitute for other things that should be done otherwise in the multilateral system. I have two questions. Um, my name's Ali Ikinofo. I'm from Pacific Trade Invest New Zealand. And as France is part of the EU, what implication is there for uh, the French ter territories to be included in the FTA between EU and New Zealand? And the second question is, what impact would that EU NZ FTA have on PACER Plus? The, the French territories. Uh, well, some of the French territories are, are under the, the, the legislation of uh, Outre-mer in, in, in France, so they are automatically included in everything we do for, for France. And, and there are specific, um, we have specific obligations, specific safeguards, specific um, regulations r related to that, that that are always dealt with. Uh, but as we haven't started, I can't foresee if there would be any specific uh, challenges or, or, or difficulties here, but, but that is the rule there. The, those who are part of, of the French uh, Outre-mer uh, regulations, they, they are automatically included. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to match you up with some officials in the room who will know this better than me at the end of this, but my understanding is that this wouldn't impact upon PESA Plus and change it. Um, PESA Plus is, a, um, is an agreement, so, and it's an agreement amongst various countries, including New Zealand and Australia, and various smaller Pacific Island nations, uh, and it is designed to be a development agreement rather than a pure trade agreement. It has been criticised by some, but from our perspective, it is more permissive of countries um, uh, being able to maintain uh, uh, protections for their own economy as they develop their economy given their small size than we would normally agree in our other trade agreements. But I don't think that would um, would change as a consequence of this one. Morena, Commissioner, Minister Parker. Um, Paula Browning here this morning for um, We Create, which is the Alliance of New Zealand's creative sector. Um, interested, Minister Parker, you've talked about FTAs build on previous FTAs, um, and most of those don't have a digital component to them. Um, massive opportunity for New Zealand in the future. Um, our digital economy is um, exploding, um, and obviously the creative industries are a huge component of that. Um, so interested in how much digital we're going to see um, in future trade agreements. Uh, well, as Commissioner Malmström has already uh, made clear, you know that's actually one of the things that needs to be uh, addressed both within the multilateral WTO system, which is out of date now, um, because these uh, technologies have developed since the rules were set, uh, and in our um, free trade agreements as such as the one proposed. Um, uh, a point that the Commissioner made yesterday was that in respect of the WTO part of that, there's already some work that's, uh, that is being uh, carried forward by a number of la nations. It was led initially by Singapore, Australia and Japan at the WTO negotiations in Buenos Aires last year and because agreement uh, on that was effectively blocked by some nations that were refusing to reach a consensus to carry it forward, um, uh, uh, a number of countries said, oh, well, look, we'll just, um, to use a terrible phrase, the coalition of the willing. <laughs> 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 um, uh, there are a number of countries have come together uh, to, um, to see if we can agree as between ourselves on a plurilateral basis on a way that other people could add themselves to those rules if they agreed in a way which is also uh, intended to be uh, uh, perhaps a way forward for the WTO to advance its agenda because and eventually the WTO might agree. Um, uh, similar provisions will no doubt be under consideration in this agreement with the European Union and I think we uh, agree on both sides that the creative um, 
uh, tech sector as well as the purely creative industries are uh, important and one of the issues that will be at large in this negotiation include things like terms to copyright uh, and that's an issue that's going to have to be negotiated in the agreement. Hi, uh, warm Pacific greetings, Andrew Lissa, Diplomat. Commissioner, I have a question here around independent foreign policy. Recently, New Zealand entertained the idea of a free trade agreement with Russia. And some of the comments from the European Union were quite disheartening. And that led to conversations around New Zealand's independent foreign policy in relation to our trade. Uh, do you think those concerns are valid? Or is this more or less media hype from uh, other quarters of society? Thank you. Well, obviously, I haven't followed all the media hype in, in the New Zealand. Uh, I, I just see the, the very grand interest around the, the, the first baby. Uh, but, but uh, I mean, absolutely, yes. Uh, New Zealand is, of course, entitled to enter into free trade agreement with any country of the world, uh, as we expect that that European Union can do that uh, without New Zealand having opinions on, on that. We, of course, can discuss in different fora. Uh, but, but as long as these trade agreements are, are, are done with the existing framework that, 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 that is there, we have absolutely no, no, no objections or no, no comments uh, whatsoever on, on who we would want to or not want to enter into trade agreements with. Um. Does the European Union hope to put in place uh, free trade agreements with most, if not all, of the CPTPP uh, countries? And uh, we've recently heard noises that the United States wants to uh, restart CPTPP <laughs> talks. And um, would uh, the US have to roll back to the tariff position uh, as it was when they left the talks. Uh, Brian Mockridge with a vested interest in uh, geographical protection for Oakuni carrots. <laughs> <laughs> Th thank you for that question. Actually, we do have trade agreements with some of the TPP 11 countries, uh, just now launching with, with New Zealand and Australia. We have we are negotiating with Chile. We have one with uh, Canada entering into force last September. Uh, we just concluded with Mexico, so that is now in the technical and legal revision part. Uh, we are um, we have one with Singapore, one with Vietnam uh, that we hope both of them can enter into force beginning of next year. Uh, we were negotiating with Malaysia a couple of years ago and then that took a break and then we will see now with the new government whether they want to restart those uh, negotiations. Who else is in? Peru? Japan. Japan, obviously, of course. We have a trade agreement with Japan that, that we will sign in a couple of weeks in Brussels and it will hopefully enter into force uh, by, by New Year. Um, and then uh, with, uh, with Peru, we have also a, uh, uh, an agreement in, in, in a more regional context. So, so basically, all, all of them we, we are either negotiating with or we have trade agreements. Uh, in terms of the US point, uh, New Zealand's actually the depository, uh, which is where if people want to express a formal interest, they actually do it for, through New Zealand for CPTPP because CPTPP was originally a very clever initiative of the then New Zealand government, uh, uh, but our trade officials essentially, who said we'll start with P2, which was us in Singapore, which spread into P4, which included Chile and, was it Malaysia? Were they the fourth one? Uh, see one of Br Brunei, Brunei was the fourth one. Uh, and the intention was to actually have an agreement, a rules-based framework that spread uh, to uh, perhaps eventually include the United States of America. And uh, it proved to be a very successful strategy which led to CPTPP. Uh, and it's deeply ironic that some of the good provisions that lie in CPTPP to constrain inappropriate competition from SOEs that are state subsidised competing overseas are actually in there because the power of the United States put them in there. So we can have SOEs for whatever we want in New Zealand but if they're state subsidised with free capital, we can't use them through CPTPP to, to improperly compete against 
you know, a Japanese corporate in Japan, for example. And, uh, and then the US, as everyone knows, has had a rather um, up and down policy on these things since. And yes, there was a reference to it being up, then down, then up again, but we've received nothing formal. Uh, we have actually received a formal uh, letter from Colombia, uh, but of course there's no uh, agreement yet into effect to accede to because it requires half of the countries in CPTPP to actually formally ratify it, which is just in process. It's likely to happen by the end of the year. But the three countries that have expressed most interest are... Um, are um, Oh, well, no, actually. <laughs> They've mentioned it, but... <laughs> um, uh, Colombia, um, Thailand and South Korea, um, they're all in the news. We haven't heard anything and others, and we really don't know how to read the uh, approach from the US. If the US wanted to come back and they just can't automatically join, they've actually got to have a negotiation, and in some ways their negotiating position is actually uh, less secure than it was when they were in the negotiation. Uh, and they, you know, they, they, they um, yeah, so who, who knows how that will roll in the future. Hello, I'm Maris Rawan from Thailand, a PhD student. Um, I have two questions. Um, my first question is, uh, I would like to learn about your views on the trade agreement uh, in relation to dairy trade, which is quite important for both of your countries. And um, what are the anticipated benefits or impacts on the dairy sector, both in the European Union and New Zealand? And my second question is regarding um, the trade for all agenda. What are the distinguished characteristics of this agenda that makes it different from trade 2030 under the previous government? And how would it change your negotiating approach towards uh, other trading partners? Thank you. Uh, uh, on, uh, on dairy, um, that will be a matter for negotiation. We want to improve dairy access into Europe. There are, of course, uh, some sensitivities in Europe, which the Commissioner has already referred to, and those things will have to be worked through in the negotiation. I would make the point that both in respect of this agreement and others, a lot of you here will be, you know, we've already passed peak cow in New Zealand, <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, 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 and that's because of environmental constraints as well as economic um, drivers. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's right. Uh, and it's, it's also a surprise to some people that uh, France already has a, a, trade, a positive trade balance with New Zealand on dairy because they produce a lot of really high quality uh, products. They actually don't need uh, New Zealand uh, high quality products uh, because they produce so many good ones themselves. And overall, at the moment, they've got a trade surplus. It's a small one in dairy. Uh, so uh, we're not quite the threat that people might imagine us to be in respect of dairy. Our largest dairy corporate, uh, Fonterra, is smaller than the large uh, European uh, dairy companies. Um, uh, what was Sorry, what was your second question? Was trade for all? How does it ch change from 2030? Well, as a... Uh, politician, uh, I, I poured scorn upon that target uh, when it was introduced by the prior government because uh, I saw it as, you know, just before the election they announced that their new ambition for trade was that 90% of all trade from New Zealand, exports from New Zealand will be covered by a free to trade agreement uh, by 2030. You could actually have decreasing exports and meet that target. And uh, given that their prior target had been to lift exports from 30% of GDP to 40% of GDP, and that after 10 years they'd gone backwards to 27% of GDP, I was making the point that free trade agreements, important though they are, are actually not the key to allocation of capital, developing new points of comparative advantage, so as to innovate as an economy to bring forward these uh, new exports of goods and services that we need to thrive. And so uh, for that reason, I... Um, have said uh, uh, and remain of the view that actually, although trade agreements are important, if you want to grow exports, you've actually got to run your economy better. Uh, and those, a lot of those signals lie in the tax system, uh, research and development incentives, education, skills matching, appropriate immigration policy, um, you know, a neutral investment signal into the economy. I'm 
Stephanie Honey from the New Zealand International Business Forum. Um, Commissioner, uh, thank you very much for your remarks and also Minister. Um, New Zealand is a very committed, strongly committed multilateralist. As a small, vulnerable economy, we depend very much on a, the integrity of the global rules-based system. And um, we're very concerned at the ratcheting up of tensions and unilateral actions that um, are taking place at the moment. We're also very concerned about the threat to the uh, you know, ongoing um, effectiveness of the WTO's appellate body. So, and we know that the European Union shares those concerns. So do you have any insights you can offer into how we can resolve this current ratcheting up of tensions? Is there a path through and, and what can New Zealand and the European Union do to help that? Thanks. Thank you for that question. Obviously, there's no easy answer to that. Uh, the WTO has long been in need of, of reform, of course, I mean, with the, 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 the rapid changes happening and with a body where 164 countries need to agree unanimously, it, it is natural that it can't catch up. We talked about digital or e-commerce uh, trade, but there are also a, a lot on, on, on investment rules, on small and medium-sized companies, on... on um, uh, services uh, on illegal fish subsidies, on agriculture, domestic support. There's a lot that needs to be done there and where we collectively ha have failed to agree uh, the, the last years. Now, of course, with the US uh, blocking the, the, the appellate body and also uh, US acting in what, what we and most of the world consider as be being in, in contradiction, I illegal uh, to, to the WTO rules on, on imposing tariffs. Um, like they, they just have done on, on aluminium and, and, and steel, it, it is worrying. So what we need to do is, of course, work together and to see how we can strengthen the WTO. We can see how we can reform its working methods. We need more transparency, more efficiency. We can, of course, discuss, can we improve the appellate body? Because it takes too much time, it's true. Um, and and um, I think mo most countries are willing to discuss some changes there while keeping the integrity of, of an appellate body because it has served us well. It has served the US very well uh, as well. Uh, and uh, the minister said, th talked about this coalition of, of uh, countries who, who want to move on in e-commerce, in digital commerce, for instance. These are almost 80 countries, rich and poor. It's not only the West. It is also countries in Africa, in Asia, or in, in all continents, because we can see the, the, the need there. So maybe that can put some, some, some flesh, to, some blood in, in the organization <coughs> while trying to solve some of the issues, like illegal fishing subsidies, which is terrible that we couldn't even agree on that in, in Buenos Aires. Um, ma ma the multilateral. Uh, so we need to keep on, on, on discussing this. There is a lot of work that has begun in, in Geneva where all our diplomats are, are. I was there just a couple of weeks ago to talk about uh, talk with a large group of friends of the system, as they are called, a little bit uh, funny. Also 40, 50 countries all across the world who really want to, to work uh, on this. Of course, New Zealand and the European Union are, are part of that group and we will be working uh, together. It will take time. Uh, but, but I think we, we need to, to show that this system is really worth saving and strengthening because if we don't have it, it's the total Wild West and the losers will be the poorest countries and the smallest countries and it will be the, 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 the survival of the fittest and that is not a world we want to live in. And with vis-a-vis -vis the, the US, well, well, for the moment relations are a bit tense um, to, to say the least, uh, but of course, you know, dialogue is, is the only way that, that we know to, to, to come out of this. Uh, m maybe. Um, maybe we need things to calm down a little bit, bit now. We have just today, um, the European Union have, have imposed counter uh, balancing measures, tariffs on, on a lot of, of products for, from, from the US. So maybe we need things to calm down a little bit, but then dialogue is of course the only way forward. The only way we know, the only way that works. Uh, kia ora, Commissioner, uh, Mr. Parker. So, uh, David, you referred to the uh, problems of inequality and you referred to Thomas Piketty in terms of the distribution between wealth and income inequality. And so um, I'm a free trader. I believe in trade. Um, you can see the results of Singapore, where they went from one of the small economies to one of the top um, high GDP per capita economies in the world through trade and exports. And so my question is like, um, in the likes of economists like Joseph Stiglitz said that FTAs are the reason why inequality is rising. And so how do you respond to critics who say that FTAs mm. are horrible and worsen uh, economic um, distribution? And what is your name? Uh, I'm Leo Hong. I'm a student at the University of Auckland. 
Uh, I, I've actually had the privilege of meeting Joseph Stiglitz on a couple of occasions. Uh, he came to um, he came to uh, New Zealand for the Readers and Writers Festival a few years ago, and it's quite an interesting little sort of typical New Zealand story. He had uh, he had met a guy called Rick Barker, who's a former Labour MP, sitting next to each other on a park bench somewhere in the world, and this, he said they, he said, "Oh, g'day, I'm I'm." Uh, I'm Rick Barker from New Zealand, who are you? And, and he said, oh, I'm Joe Stiglitz. And he said, not the Joseph Stiglitz. And he said, yes, the Joseph Stiglitz. And they, they became email friends. And so, uh, yeah, and, and so when, when he, uh, when he came, was con came to New Zealand, when he was uh, promoting his book, The Two Trillion Dollar War, which is about the unfunded you know, yeah, costs of, you know, of you know, the improper treatment of the US soldiers who came home disabled. Um, uh, he, um, I was invited to dinner with him, and um, uh, and I sat next to him, and we got on famously. I really enjoyed the night, and I looked him up since when I was in in um, New York or Washington, one of those places. Once when I was, when I was when I was because one of my other interests is monetary policy, so, and that's one of his too. I, I, he's not opposed to trade; he's just opposed to inappropriate clauses in trade agreements, and. Uh, uh, and uh, and so am I. Um, uh, I don't blame uh, trade for the rise in inequality around the world. I do blame multinational tax avoidance uh, and uh, inadequate taxes, including in New Zealand, at uh, having fair redistribution of income and even just fair tax uh, so that uh, the wealthiest people in society pay the same rate of tax as uh, middle income people on their income, which doesn't happen in many countries in the world and certainly doesn't happen in New Zealand. So trade can't fix that. Trade's not the cause of it, but trade can't fix it. So you've got to look to answers outside of the trading system to fix that one. Uh, hello, my name is Sarah Salmon from Ross McVeigh, so I'm an international trade lawyer. I've got a question for you about trading with Iran. Um, obviously, the US has pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal. The EU and various um, EU member states have sought exemptions from the Iran tariffs and imposed countermeasures. Do you think that is going to be enough to keep European businesses in Iran? And do you think there's anything that the uh, EU and perhaps New Zealand and other like-minded countries can do to try and challenge the extraterritorial application of the US sanctions? This is a big headache for the moment, obviously, and I think that, that both EU, New Zealand and many other countries of the world have, um, have deplored the US decision because obviously Iran has complied with the measures as confirmed by the, the inspection bodies of the United Nations and the EAA. Uh, and that, has, uh, that, that was the purpose of, of, of the agreement. It wasn't to change the regime of Iran, it was to make sure they don't develop the bomb, <laughs> to, to, be, to be blunt. Uh, and that, 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 that they have uh, respected. Uh, and now many big, big and small companies have invested and, and thought that that gave them a security. And, and the aim was, of course, that, that by, um, by, by um, taking Iran more into the global trading that you could also you know, have a positive influence on, on, on the debate. And now many countries are in the situation that they don't, many companies that they don't know what, what law to break uh, on this. So we are obviously discussing with many partners, see how we can save this uh, agreement. Uh, this is an ongoing discussion between foreign ministers uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and also we, we need, of course, to make sure that Iran uh, wants to save it, uh, because this is a discussion that is sensitive between the different uh, the, the different political strands in, 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 in Iran, between the more conservative and the more progressives. Um, so so th it, it is difficult. We are, we are looking at whether we can have a, a blocking statute to, to, to do this, but, but um, will it be enough to, to, to save it? Um, it? It's ongoing discussion. We're looking lawyers from the cro across the European Union, but also working with the United Nations to, to si find a way out of this, uh, because obviously we don't have huge funds from our taxpayers to, 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 to uh, make sure that we compensate for that. So for the moment, it's ongoing work. We'll see if it is possible. 
and they're everybody who has an interest to, to preserve this. New Zealand is obviously one of these countries. Uh, we'll try, um, but, but I'm, I'm not sure, fr uh, frankly, that we will succeed, but, uh, but it's, it's uh, definitely worth an effort and uh, that those talks continue as we speak here between our representatives and, and the, the foreign ministers and with many other countries. The only thing I would add to that um, is that um, it's very difficult for some of the companies that are trading with Iran mm -hmm. if they're forced to choose between that trade and other trade, uh, which uh, in the end arises not just with their trade into the US but the complex way in which the banking system is so dependent upon the U American system, the US system, I shouldn't say the American system. Uh, and. Uh, um, the worry is that uh, the uh, unilateral breach of the international agreement, which we believe in, will be effective, and that points to other problems in 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 uh, in, in those underlying mechanisms. Does the European Parliament have a role in trade agreements that the EU negotiates? at least at the end of the process and confirming them? Yes, the question was whether there is a role for the European Parliament uh, in the, the um, trade agreements uh, and, and in what stage. Yes, yes sir, they do. Uh, for, first of all, we, we do get the mandate from, from the member states in order to start negotiations with, with any country proposed by the Commission, but then the member states uh, discuss it and may add or, 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 or change uh, a few things. Uh, in, in that process, there's a constant dialogue with the European Parliament, specifically the, the committee that is dealing with this, the, the Committee for, uh, for International Trade. So there's a very um, constant dialogue with them in the preparations. Um, and uh, as, they, as we, t we go on with the negotiations, of course, me and my, my collaborators and the negotiating team regularly report to the member states and to the European Parliament. Uh, and I'm being asked to come very often and sometimes it could be another committee who wants to have specific information about a specific sector. It could be the Agriculture Committee or, or the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, in the end, uh, they have to vote uh, in order to, uh, to, to approve it. So the, the process is that once it is agreed and signed, member states uh, agree, the, 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 the governments, and then it is sent to the European Parliament, who look at it, and to vote. And if it is an agreement like the one we have, which does not contain investment, investment protection, it is an EU-only agreement, meaning that member states and, um, and European Parliament agree, then it's done. If it contains chapters on, on uh, investment protection and so on, it becomes a mixed agreement. The one we have with Canada, for instance. The Can Canadian agreement entered into force only provisionally, member states, um, have, have agreed on a government basis, the European Parliament has adopted it, but it also needs to be ratified in all our national parliaments. And that's quite a lot. In the country I live, Belgium, they have six, for instance, parliaments, and they all need to ratify. So overall, I think that's 42 parliaments. It's quite a, a process. For Canada, 12 countries have ratified in their national systems, and we are 28, so you can count. Um, so it, it depends a little bit of, of the nature, but this will have definitely needs to be ratified by the European Parliament, but not by the national parliaments. But obviously, we want to keep them engaged and informed uh, as well, because uh, it, it is important, because then they have to defend it towards their, their voters and their constituencies. And, and um, so, so they are involved, uh, and, and we are working very much to, to increase that, that kind of information. Can I ask your name, sir? Thank you very much. Um, Itifano, we're going to take two more questions. One of those questions is going to be from our online fan base. Um, so from an anonymous caller <laughs> to our panel. Um, with New Zealand reviewing and updating our copyright law, will an EU FTA preserve latitude for New Zealand's approach to creativity and innovation? Uh, most certainly, yes. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, uh, we, look, the, the differences between the European Union on, and uh, New Zealand on these issues go to time periods, not principles. Um, uh, we both believe that you should be giving a period of monopoly protection to, in both copyright and patent law for the creator of the work. And if you don't do that, of course, you don't get as much creativity because the people who try to sustain themselves through their creativity could just have their creativity ripped off by somebody else who you know, prints it 
uh, well not prints it but these days just uh, sells it electronically for for close to nothing so um, uh, uh, copyright is an essential part of of uh, protection of the output of uh, especially the creative art sectors but also the commercial sector that creates um, something new uh, that they've had to invest in uh, where there are slight differences between New Zealand and uh, the European Union is how long that protection should last uh, and um, I, I have those discussions within my own household <laughs> for, for <laughs> uh, um, um, as to what is the appropriate period and that will be a matter of negotiation uh, as between the European Union and uh, New Zealand. And one final question from the audience. Yes. Oh. Uh, hi, my name is Sam. I'm a student at the University of Auckland. Um, so I understand that our trade, free trade agreement with China is one of the more sophisticated ones that exists in the world. Um, so I was thinking, uh, will we expect something similar for Europe, from Europe, in the sense that um, the level of sophistication and transparency that we get from China? Ab absolutely. They compete with European agreements for length. <laughs> uh, interestingly, a, a lot of the language that is in the uh, China FTA actually found its way into CPTPP, um, because uh, as a as a um, a uh, small country after uh, the United Kingdom joined the European Community back in the 70s, we actually had to find our way in the world in a very difficult space. And for a little country, we've actually got very very competent trade negotiators, uh, and. Uh, um, uh, so does the European Union, uh, as the United Kingdom is finding out. <laughs> uh, and no doubt the uh, United Kingdom do too. Actually, all countries are pretty well equipped in these things these days. Um, but, but actually, a, a, lot, a, lot of these, a lot of these things are, um, uh, whatever the wording is, the principles that are being articulated are, are, are actually common to a lot of agreements these days and you can express things in different words and um, so a lot of the language that will appear in the final agreement will be European language, some of it will be our language but they'll be articulating principles that are common now to most agreements. We've now come to the conclusion of our hui. Um, I'd like to just um, offer some insight into a Māori understanding of trade. Um, so the Māori understanding of trade is a word called utu. And unlike the movie in the 80s, although, um, uh, Commissioner, if you want to watch utu, you can um, tonight. Um, and I will look through the 1600 word um, document and yeah. Um, but the word utu essentially is reciprocity. Reciprocity for common good. Utu is all about building bridges and not walls. Um, if I can use the word utu as an acronym for a term which is United Trade Understanding. So in a real true sense of utu and the values and principles that underpin that, oh, and I'll be more than happy to come over to Sweden um, and deliver those principles at any time. Um, in a real, real, tr <laughs> real true sense of utu and aroha, I'd like to thank you, thank com the Commissioner and our Minister for hosting us here this, uh, today. Kia ora. And we're going to close off with our song, Etu Tato. Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Raro, Raro, Tenakoto, Katua. Kia ora. <laughs>